I'm Joe Crowley. Uh, welcome to the Quilt Achieviate Theatre for our session on rare breeds. We are in quite a special place in the UK. We're talking about the heritage we've got here with, with rare breeds, and it's extraordinary. It's very unique. I'm reliably informed by my wonderful panel here that we have over 100 native breeds of sheep, goats, cattle, horses, and pigs, and over 75 native breeds of ducks, t uh, turkeys, and chicken. So, if you're all sitting comfortably, we're going to have a quick spot quiz. How many can you name? I'm joking, we won't be doing that. <laughs> Relax, it's okay, we've got the experts here. Um, but what is the best way to safeguard our rare breeds, and, and why should we? That's what we're going to be talking about here. We've got a great panel to discuss that. I'm going to introduce them all properly as we go along. But first of all, just quickly put your hands together for Tim Morris, Clifford Freeman, Harriet Bunning, and John Gay. So, let's start with Tim uh, here on my left. Now, Tim uh, is a man, Professor Tim Morris, I should say, is a man who wears many hats. He is uh, a non-exec uh, on DEFRA's Animal Health and Welfare Board. He's experienced in veterinary medicine, and he keeps South Down sheep, just a few of the things he does. Uh, he's also the vice uh, chair of trustees at the Rare Breed Survival Trust, which is why he is here today. So, Tim, take it away. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, uh, our great thanks to Quilt Achieviate and Tim Healy for the invitation to speak here about um, Britain's native breeds of livestock. Um, as you are heard already, you're going to hear from the rest of the panel a bit later, but I'm going to start off just giving a broad introduction to the trust itself before they actually talk about the native breeds, how we uh, breed them, grow them, and actually eat them as well. So I'm the vice chair of the Rare Breed Survival Trust, um, we keep a few South Down sheep. They're a good example of a British native breed that used to cover the South Downs, then became rare, and then that's because farming pattern changes. And then people realised that they were very good just on grass, converting that to meat, very cost efficient, good margins for farmers, and they've come back in numbers. But unless things like, like that happen, we will lose our breeds. So, Alderney cattle, Ulster pigs, limestone sheep, uh, Manx horses, uh, Lincolnshire chickens, you'll never see them. They're gone. They're extinct. And you'll see there's a pack available um, with a, the Rare Breed Survival Trust watch list, which if you haven't got one already, pick it up on the way out. You'll be surprised at the low numbers that are there. Some of them are much rarer than British wildlife. And some of them, you may have grown up with them and realize they have suddenly become rare. So it's a real strong wake-up call. We've got to use them or lose them. So that's why the trust is here. And it started in 1973. And it's very appropriate we're talking here because one of the founders was no less than Joe Henson, Adam Henson's uh, father. But actually, he's not the most important Henson to us in our first job, which is to monitor rare breeds, because his sister, Libby, runs the software company that provides many of the pedigree books for our uh, British breeds. And that's our first function, which is to uh, monitor the numbers, because if we don't know how many there are, we can't do something if the numbers are falling. So each year, the trust uh, with breed societies and with government counts how many there are in terms of breeding females because we need to know if numbers are going up or down. Now, the government does support us in this. I don't give us any money, but we work together. But what's unusual, unlike usually the rest of the world, they don't do anything else. We do the rest. So that's the reason why I feel no shame in asking you as a charity to support us. So that's one of our major functions, is to actually do a census every single year to look at what's going up and what's going down. So have a look at that in your packs you'll find um, at the door. Please do feel free to take them. So the second thing we do is save them. Now what I mean by that is there are breeds that do need growing in numbers. Numbers isn't the only thing, though, because you could have a 1,000 animals, but if they weren't terribly diverse genetics, I'd rather have a 100 of very well-managed um, uh, breed. So we have a group of field officers who advise us on breed numbers, breed policy, working with farmers, 
working with the breed societies, working in partnership. But when we say save, we really do mean save at times. Now, you know, you may be aware of IVF for uh, fertility treatment in, in women, but actually, all that technology started a long time before it was used in human medicine, and it was started in the 1940s to try and raise agricultural production by doing things like freezing uh, sperm for, for cows that were of a higher quality. That technology is developed, and we do freeze both sperm, eggs, and embryos of our native breeds. And that's a key part of our role, where we're also um, thankful for the advice and help both of our field officers, but partners who support us, such as the genetics companies. And in fact, this autumn, we're going to be upping that because we'll be launching a national gene bank to really make sure we've got representative genetic samples. Now again, that's very much sort of backroom stuff, and in other countries that's paid for directly or indirectly by the government, but we have to do it yourself. So again, no shame in asking you for support. Our final role is promoting, and here, this is not just down to the trust and uh, a small range of partners. This is just down to the whole of the farming and consumer community. And that's part of the reason why I've asked the three others here to talk, because actually it's not something that we should just say happens. We should help breeders breed, growers grow, and either to eat them, use their wool, conservation grazing, work the horses, all those other things. Because I think the key message I'd like to get across to you today, it really is a use them or lose them. Uh, yes, we have saved any breeds going extinct since 1973, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen unless we do something about it. So just to add, that's a very dry way of putting it. So to add some color, I'd like to pass you over to first Clifford, um, and then the others to actually tell their stories about how they're using our native breeds of British livestock. And by the way, that includes not only pigs, cattle, sheep, poultry, uh, horses, um, all different sorts of po poultry. So let's think broadly about this. Clifford. Uh, hello, um, I'm Clifford Freeman and I come from uh, Gloucestershire, which makes me one of the luckiest people here um, because we have three of the best breeds in the country. Um, I uh, was lucky enough to, um, to have a father who was uh, very keen on saving traditional breeds but also county traditions and at the tender age of six was introduced to Gloucester cattle. So in 1971, and yes I don't look my age but thank you, um, Two cattle arrived uh, in the farm, and that was my start on the Gloucester cattle. Now, in 1973, the last herd of Gloucesters was sold. That was, uh, there was 33 in that herd, and um, the breed then had to be saved. And Adam's father, Joe, and my father, and a group of others set about um, saving the Gloucester cattle. Now, they've done very good at job of saving the breed, but for 40 years, that's what happened. The breed was saved, preserved, and almost become museum pieces to be seen only in farm parks and various other things. Um, I was lucky enough to sell my business in 2008, where um, coming out of a, a, a poultry business, so I know a little bit about meat, not red meat, but white meat. And at that time, my father had 22 cattle left. He'd, he'd gone through a process of selling off, and he was getting older, and, and we had 22. And it kind, of quickly gave, it kind of quickly dawned on me that I couldn't really afford to keep these cattle uh, just to look at them. Um, so we had to do something with them. So the other thing I realized is that nobody else is doing anything either. So we ended up with the, the numbers were starting to go backwards as, as the people that saved the breed were... Uh, retiring and then eventually um, dying. So um, we, uh, I said about finding as many different uh, bloodlines as I could. So, and the idea was to market the meat. Um, so off, off we went, and um, we've now uh, we've now got ourselves uh, 270 uh, cattle, uh, Gloucesters I've got, and um, 
out of, out of those is about 160 females and about 100 steers. And we set out a business of um, finding a market for the meat. Now, coming from the poultry industry, I learned that the only way you make any money is on how well you sell the legs, not how well you sell the breast meat, because obviously that sells itself. And that's the same with the red meat. You know, you need the, the steaks sell themselves, so you've got to sell the front end. So we've, we set up a, a little business um, selling burgers, and, um, and that seems to work. So we're now putting burgers into uh, our little franchise cooking um, outside catering unit, and then the rest of the meat, or a lot of the meat, is going into um, restaurants. Uh, also now up into London and locally within Gloucestershire. So in June, we produced 7,500 burgers, which actually it came to a quite a lot of um, Gloucester steers. So that's, we're well on the way to actually, we've created a market, we're actually now getting to a point where we need to be finding more steers. So I've got to get more people to breed them, so that's, that's really good. When we started doing the steers and, the, and we started creating these burgers, the people that were selling said, well, we need some pedigree Gloucester Old Spot sausages. So pigs aren't really my favorite thing, um, but they do taste good. And so we, um, so, so now, now for my scenes, I'm finishing about 60 to 70 Gloucester Old Spots at, at a time, uh, mainly going to sausages and again, for the outside catering, but also um, the loins and the cheeks, and uh, then we do a bit of bacon going into restaurants and butchers as well. Um, one other thing I've got is Rhineland sheep. Again, a local breed, more of a Herefordshire breed rather than a Gloucestershire breed, but um, you know, don't hold that against me. And um, they they uh, they tend to get a bit fat, like all rare breeds they tend to get a little bit fat if you try and farm them in the conventional way. If you feed them um, on grass, like all of mine are, apart from the pigs obviously, but then, then we don't have this issue. Um, and the one thing we found is that uh, with these, all these breeds, we have to grow the frame um, to hang the meat on. And if you do that, you end up with a really, really good meat that isn't too fat. And the public, the, the problem is a lot of people that eat meat eat meat that's been comes from a supermarket and that doesn't necessarily taste like meat um, if you've eaten good meat you'll you know, you'll know what I mean so it's about educating as well educating the uh, the public there to eat to try this stuff and actually realize that what we produce is is far superior to what you can you can normally get um, yeah, well, that's just about finish it. I'm going to jump back in there, actually. Uh, so, uh, just, I'm curious. So, effectively, when you get these Gloucesters going, you decide you're going to make a commercial go of it, you have to do their PR, then, do you? You have to go out and meet restaurant managers. I mean, how, how much hard work was that? Were you doing taste tests? How are you persuading people to, to take this meat? Well, the, big, the biggest issue was consistency and continuity. So, I was turning up and saying, oh, I can do your Gloucester beef. Yeah, I'll have one. I put one in, and then they like it, and then they go, when can I have the next one? Well, they're quite rare, um, <laughs> perhaps six months, perhaps 12 months. So the first thing we had to do was actually build up enough numbers to be able to go out there and, um, and sell them. So that's, that's, that's the first job. So that means we had several years of no money coming in and yeah. all the money going out. Um, but once you've got them started, and we started with the burgers, um, had a little burger stand in Gloucester Rugby Club. So we set up there, we had a couple of pictures of the animals that the burgers came from, you know, saying, so, you know, here we are, Gloucester cattle and their names and all the rest of it, which, which, you know, some people were interested, other people weren't, I don't really want to see which cow it came from. But what we got, what the response we got was, God, these are good. These are really good. This is what burgers should taste like. And the, the best, the greatest accolade was, um, we had some Texans come over to watch a rugby match, they said, these are some of the best burgers I've ever tasted. From a Texan? So, yeah, from a Texan. Wow. So, you know, that, that, that says something. Um, wow. So once we, yeah, and it was a case of that. So once we got to that stage, we then went out and, and we produced more. And yeah, it is a case of pushing and getting people into there and doing the legwork and, um, and hopefully... Well, with started. that work, you'd say the encouraging thing is there is an appetite for it, not, um, no pun intended, but there are, the people are interested in, in sort of real meat, as you'd put it. Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. Well, once you get people to try it, they then realize that 
that's what meat tastes like. Yeah, okay, great. Let's move on to Harriet. So Harriet uh, Bunning uh, owns the Haviland herd of belted and rigid Galloways along with her mother. Uh, Harriet's been showing cattle since she was a small child and is passionate about belted Galloways and their ability to thrive as a hill breed. Is that right? Take it away. Tell us more. Um, so, thank you very much. Um, my name's Harriet. Um, I come from, my family have a small farm in Devon. Um, we keep three traditional native breeds. Um, that's the belted Galloways. You might have seen them. They're kind of fluffy cows, big white stripe around the middle, <laughs> hence the bel name belted. Um, and also the Rigget Galloways, which are just another rarer color of Galloway. They have a white line along their back, a bit like the Gloucesters. Um, we, we also have um, grey-faced Dartmoor sheep, but I'll be honest, I like the cows better, so I'll <laughs> talk about the cows. Um, uh, we come, yeah, we, we farm in Devon, and in Devon you see a lot of Galloways, which doesn't necessarily make sense because Galloways come from the southwest of Scotland. Clifford said that he keeps Gloucesters because he, he farms in Gloucester. It makes sense. These breeds are kind of, they're well adapted to the, to the areas that they come from. But if you look at the climate and the, the land in southwest Scotland, and then you compare it to the hill land Dartmoor and Exmoor in, in Devon, you see they're actually surprisingly similar. Maybe it's a little bit chillier in Scotland, but we get more rain in Devon, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so Galloways, they're a hill breed of cattle. They do really well up on the tops. They've got this amazing double coat, so you can leave them out all winter. And we, we chose them just mainly for that, that ability to be very thrifty, very hardy, and a breed that, that doesn't need to be fed extra. The way we, we choose to farm in a more extensive way. So it's, it's not the fashionable way of farming now, like what you were saying about not feeding all of the concentrates and the grain, because these breeds haven't been selectively bred to perform in that way. They do well on pasture-fed so that's if you just let them eat grass and then cut so either hay or silage and then feed them that through the winter. And it will take longer, but the meat is so much tastier. And if you want to do that sort of farming, really there's nothing better than a, a native or traditional breed. And also from, if we kind of take a step back and look at like global food security, um, it's quite interesting because You'll hear a lot of people choose to be vegetarian because they think that any grain we produce ought to be fed to the people because we haven't got enough grain to be feeding it to cows and then eating the cows. But if you keep cattle like Galloways, these breeds that are very hardy, they can live on ground that you wouldn't be able to use to produce any other food. Um, the, the kind of hill sheep in Scotland are another great <coughs> example of this, things like the Scotch Blackface, which is a very successful native breed. They will produce meat on the top of a mountain, you're not going to be able to produce any food from that land in any other way. Mm. So, yeah. Um, Very good. Tell us about your, your PhD. You've done a lot of research in terms of, well, quite complicated stuff, which is probably over my head here, but just sum it up for us a little bit and, and what view it gives you on the, on the position of rare breeds. So, um, when I'm <coughs> not at the farm in Devon, I work in science. If we look back four years ago, I was stuck in a lab down in Cornwall researching the sex life of cockroaches. Um, and kind of thinking, this is all well and good, but I kind of miss my cows. Um, so I took a year off, went and worked for the Rare Breed Survival Trust for a year and met so many amazingly passionate people and went, I just, I need to find a way of mixing science and cows. So I'm now studying a PhD up in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh and Scotland's Rural College. And the, the PhD is looking at animal breeding and genetics, which, um, but, I'm using it to try and breed better cows for farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, which at first seems very different to hear. Um, my lovely fluffy Galloways at home wouldn't do very well in very hot sub-Saharan Africa, but it's really opened my eyes just how important the diversity in livestock breeds is. Um, if you, yeah, so a, a good example of that is that there's this very small, quite kind of unimpressive looking breed of cow. They're tiny little things from West Africa called the Indama cattle. And they grow very slowly. They produce very little milk. So not very, you don't, they don't look very appealing as a farmer. But if you go to these regions, everyone has nothing but Indama. And you find out that the reason why is because there's a disease that's through all of these areas called trypanosomiasis. 
and if you put any other breed of cow in that area, it will just die of the disease immediately. But these Ndama cattle have something in their genetics that makes them resistant to that. And I think if we, 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 it's very difficult to predict what will happen in the future. And if we lose this diversity of breeds, we might end up in a situation where we don't have the cattle breed that is resistant to the next disease. Mm, so a really good awareness for keeping as many breeds as possible it's going, or keeping all of them going, the diversity. Yeah. Great, thank you, Harriet. Now let's uh, move on to John. So John uh, Gay is a chef. In 2008, he was selected as Norfolk Young Chef of the Future. And as a Norfolk boy, I just know how prestigious that is. So congratulations. That's thank a you very big, much. big achievement. Um, John runs his own award-winning cookery school uh, and is the head chef at Jimmy's Farm. That's right, isn't it? With Jimmy Doherty, um, the TV presenter, uh, who I think is linked. He's your president. Is he yes, of the Rare Breeds? He's the president of the Rare Breeds Survival Trust and very passionate about them. There we go, all links together. So John runs the farm's restaurant, field kitchen, and uses native breeds of livestock, many of which are raised on the farm, I think. John, tell me, apart from the farm, but how did you discover rare breeds then? So as a chef, um, sort of native breeds, has probably in the last 10 years sort of come on my radar um, when I sort of found out about these fantastic tasting meats that other restaurants were having. Um, producers like yourself who are coming in saying, try this, try that. And that was how I found it. So no other reason than they tasted really good. So I knew nothing other than they were sort of the premium of flavor. And as a chef, that's what you want to be serving and want to be cooking. So that's how I kind of stumbled, stumbled across them. Um, and I took the job at Jimmy's Farm three and a half years ago. So it's a 280 acre farm um, in the Suffolk in Suffolk now, so I've left Norfolk sadly behind. Um, still support Norwich cities, so that's good, fine. Good, 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 uh, good. Haven't gone blue yet. Um, <laughs> but so we're lovely in this lovely, lovely Suffolk countryside um, where we can produce some fantastic uh, rare breed, uh, rare breed meats. Um, and for a chef, um, speaking on behalf of the Rare Breed Survival Trust is unusual. Um, you don't often hear of panda saving charities having someone at the end of the panel <laughs> talking about cooking the pandas. Um, so we're in a slightly unusual position here. Um, but it's about, as you said earlier, it's about eating these breeds, uh, making them financially viable for farmers, making farmers actually want to keep these breeds and having that demand there for the burgers or whatever it might be you produce. Um, as a chef, um, you have to look at every breed specifically. Um, in the same way we have different varieties of apples, you wouldn't make an apple crumble out of a Granny Smith, um, you wouldn't make chips out of a red potato, you, just, you know, every pig has a different, different reason for cooking it. If you want to get some fantastic crackling, take a middle white. If you want a really nice chop, take a mangalitsa. You know, every pig should be looked at in a separate, in a separate way to be cooked differently. The cooking times vary slightly. Um, you know, the, the size of an, the eye on the loin will vary from a Gloucester to a saddleback or whatever it might be. You know, every, every animal is to be treated differently um, when you're cooking. Give us some tips. So, uh, if people here want to go home and have, so just say a great steak, what, you know, give us some, some, a few names people can take away of things maybe to try to ask their butcher about. I'm putting you on the spot now, I know. Um, well, I really like Dexter. Dexter beef. Me too. Oh, um, I think Dexter no. beef is okay. fantastic. Um, a ribeye off of Dexter, I think, is great. Yeah. But it's, a, it's, a, it's personal taste. Yeah. Um, the same way we go to a supermarket and some of us will want a bit more fat on our steak, some will want less. People's, people's, people's sort of um, you know, taste varies on those kind of things. So it's quite a specific thing. How good's your palate? Do you plan? I mean, can you really taste quite key differences between meats and, and plan you know, how you cook them and what goes with them accordingly? We like to think so, but right. when, I mean, if they're going to pull out a tray of bacon and there's six different breeds, I'm going to have to spot them. Um, probably not. But it, I think you can you notice the difference in the fat, you notice the difference in the colour of the fat before you're cooking, the way the fat melts into the meat, yeah. um, and the sort of the, the eye on the bacon, as I say, or the size of the, the shoulder. Um, so there are vari the variants like that um, that you will, you will spot. Okay, um, so let's have a, I mean, we can open this up to the floor as well. So if anyone's got any burning questions, just stick your hand up. But I'm, I, I'm going to kick us off. We say you've got to eat them, you've got to use them. What if they don't taste good? How do we keep them going? Are we reliant on hobby farmers to keep them going? What happens? Because we might need them in the future, right? That's the point. Well, yeah, I'm not sure which ones don't, eat, uh, don't taste good. Um, obviously, the Gloucester does, and that's obviously the most important one. <laughs> um, but um, there, there is a reliance on, on, there's been a reliance on hobby farmers to, to keep them, and I'm sure they will, that will continue. Um, but there must be 
part of them that eats well. There must be part of them, that, you know, they, they either produce milk, you know, they, you know, produce good cheese, you know, we haven't mentioned that, and, you know, the Gloucester again produces good cheese, and very many other breeds um, produce the right milk to make good cheeses. Um, and there's other ways of, of, of doing it. It's not just about the breed, it's about the specification of the way they're fed. So everything we do is grass fed, but, but that doesn't suit all breeds. Um, you know, uh, whether you, and then wh which, uh, which um, fodder they're eating, uh, what grass they're eating, you know, it might be salt marsh for some lambs, it could be seaweed for, the, uh, for the, uh, some of the other sheep breeds. Um, and that affects the flavor. Um, and also then the, the hanging time, the butchering, the, the whole whole process. It isn't just about taking the animal and saying well, that's good, um, but that's the same with all meat. Okay, um, I want to come back to something you said earlier, Tim. You said you talked about the backroom stuff, which is sort of genomics and and working out bloodlines and various things. It's quite complicated, I know, but this must be a really exciting. You're sort of suggesting it wasn't that exciting, but we can know far more about our animals and bloodlines and DNA and everything now. This must be a really exciting time. For, for, the, for the charity in that respect. So, um, when you talk about genetics, um, a better word is genomics, which is the whole three billion genes in a cow, a human. We can now actually measure all that for less than a thousand pounds. What it means, we can do a full genetic fingerprint of all the different breeds and understand the differences, but also understand if there's disease resistance, something like that, how it helps. And so this has really revolutionized animal breeding. And that's the sort of thing we can do to make sure that our scarce resources are well directed to good breeding programs. Because when they are low in numbers, when they're rare, what we want to do is build them up. But we don't want to build them up in a haphazard manner, which doesn't maintain the breed qualities. And one breed qualities could be the taste of the meat, their hardiness, their resistance to disease, all those other matters. So in our back room, we now have those tools and we're using them. We're also, as I said, doing that gene banking so that farmers can come back and say, I want to build up my Gloucester herd a little bit more, but I need some more genetic diversity. What have you got in the gene bank to take that forward? Or for another sheep breed, or for another pig breed, or indeed for horses. Now, I'm not suggesting eating horses, but actually I am suggesting that they can be used for certain form of conservation grazing. They graze in a very different way to cattle and sheep. Uh, or they could be used for things like uh, forestry uh, management in sensitive areas. They're there. To answer the question, are any of them basically so useless they shouldn't survive? No, they've all got a niche. It's happening to know what they are. I'm going to give you an example. I talked about South Down sheep. They were so numerous because of their wool. Wool isn't a great sale at the moment because uh, there are synthetic fibres, there's imports from overseas, but actually South Down wool is really, really the perfect wool for duvets. Now, we didn't have duvets 100 years ago, we have them now, so let's use it. And there are companies who do that. So I think we're limited only by our imagination uh, and our palates. Hmm. Um, without meaning to, to link on so literally, uh, I, I wanted to bring Harriet in here on palettes uh, because you've got a great analogy about the paint palette and, and, and you've got a view on crossbreeding, which I want you to sort of just explain as well in terms of muddying colours or not. <laughs> So this is the point at which I admit that I'm talking about these purity, we're here talking about these purity of these very important traditional breeds, but, but the work that I'm doing in my PhD is actually looking at crossbreeding, which is sometimes a bit of a, a dirty word amongst people who have pedigree livestock. But I definitely think that crossbreeding is really important. We can use crossbreeding to take advantage of genetics from different places. Um, if we're talking about cattle, a great example of this, I obviously I'm passionate about hill cattle. Um, we have blue-gray cattle. They're a cross between um, the black Galloways and the um, white-bred shorthorns. And the white-bred shorthorn mothers produce, they, they, they do their offspring really well, and the Galloways are really hardy and a bit more beefy. And so you cross them together, and you get those two kind of complementary characteristics of the breeds. 
And then there's also this element of hybrid figure that you might have heard of. It's a bit like how mongrel dogs often are a bit bigger than the, the purebred type. They're just, just a bit more vigorous, I guess, is the best way of explaining it. So there's definitely, we can take advantage of crossbreeding, but in order to take advantage of crossbreeding, we have to have the purebred animals there. Um, yes, my analogy that I was explaining backstage earlier is if you say an artist and you have a paint palette and you have, you have the three primary colours and they're great and you like the colours and you can paint a painting just using those three colours or you could mix them together and also produce interesting purples and oranges and they're great as well and they have their place. But if you just mix all the paint together in a haphazard way, don't keep the pure primary colours, you're just going to end up with a slightly nasty muddy brown colour and that's not going to be useful for anything. So it's really important that we keep our, our purebred breeds pure and we can carry out crossbreeding but we need, we need the pure breeds as well. Great, thank you. Now, I'm aware that time is running on. I'm, I just wonder if any, anyone has any questions at all. I don't know if anyone here keeps any rare breeds or has any points they'd like to raise. Now is your moment to get involved if you do. Yes? Where are we? Just here. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see there. We're going to bring a microphone to you, so hang on. And there we go. Is there a tent where we can buy some of your meat? Uh, so where we can buy rare breed meat? Yeah, I, yeah. And it, uh, so rare breed meats, uh, often your local butcher will be able to get oh. hold of them. Uh, there's some rare breed meat suppliers here today who are selling oh, um, some fantastic it? products. Jimmy's Farm, we sell our meat online right. um, and it will be couriered out to you. So that's on the website, jimmysbutchery.com, I think, okay. um, and you can order that. Um, but uh, online butcheries is now a fantastic thing. It means that we can send our meat up to Scotland or wherever it might be, all in a cool box and what have you. The way that the technology's improved for sending cold meat, you know, it's fantastic. So all available online uh, for those kind of Thank things. Thank you very much. Um, if you look on the Rare Breed Survival Trust website, and that's why that, that little sort of <coughs> map of England is on the, the screens there, we've got a sort of search by what you want by region uh, function. And yes, the internet has made that all available. And so... Uh, have a have a look and and go and buy something you'd never have bought before. Yeah, I think that's probably the message for today. Is it to to, to try something else, to search maybe rare breeds to your local area and um, or just the Gloucesters from well, Clifford. I obviously, don't know. obviously, <laughs> that is the most important one. But um, <laughs> you you never know what uh, what you're missing until you try it. And uh, I remember bringing chefs to my farm, and they went, yeah, yeah, what's different? What's different? And then I gave them the meat and they went wow you know and especially the lamb you know lamb's something that you know comes from New Zealand in big ships and and it was the lamb that really the, the chefs that came to my place they had the lamb they said god I never realized that lamb could taste like the good wow it's quite a thought well look thank you uh, for coming oh no let's have a sorry go on yes Oh, it's really interesting to hear what you've been talking about. Thank you. And obviously good to support in the UK. I just wondered if it's not uh, too dodgy to ask, what is the interchange with Europe and the wider world for these, these breeds? So you, you mean uh, how they're spread across Europe or you mean... Uh, yes, or is there sharing across beyond the UK? Yeah. Let me ask, there's a really interesting story about this. Actually, generally, Europe has its own distinctive breeds. And, uh, you know, let's celebrate those. But actually, our, our British breeds uh, are unique to Britain, and we've got tons of them. But the most fascinating story is about Herefords, which have had some new blood introduced. And they're, they're lovely to eat Herefords. But actually, the original Herefords do thrive better on pasture and poor pasture. So you want to keep the gene pool open. So where do you go? Well, you don't go to Australia, do you? Because we sent them out there a century ago and they've, they've sort of bred differently. No, we did some genomics with the Hereford um, breeders who are interested in those old population types and they're a really good resource. So we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have spent money bringing them back and the breeders if they hadn't had that genomic technology to say they are a time capsule that will really help bring the breeding along. So um, no, it's, it's, it's the Commonwealth again now. So if we're talking about Europe and Brexit, back to the Commonwealth. <laughs> I think that's fascinating. Were we a bit snobbish about um, Australian cattle? Were we sort of not sure if they were quite pure enough then? And, and we're only struts snobbish about the Australians. <laughs> okay, full stop, full stop. Uh, anyone else? Yes, madam. Uh, we can probably quickly grab a mic to you. Ooh, there we go. Oh, 
Uh, so just here, uh, Sasha, lady in the jacket there. Thank you. It's on. It should be on. Oh, thanks. Um, regarding crossing the purebreds in order to get certain traits, isn't that a little bit difficult, a bit hit and miss, because you can't guarantee that the traits that you're after are actually going to come out in a crossbreed? Yes. Um, so in my PhD, I'm, I'm looking at the actual genetics um, of the, the breeds and then we can, we can more predict. Actually, the first cross is usually reasonably stable. F1s, um, if you talk to plant breeders, um, most of the plants that we eat are produced by a first cross. So they have these inbred lines, they cross them. The very first lot are all reasonably similar and they're all, they have that hybrid vigor. It's once you go on from there that it all gets a bit, there's a huge amount of variation. Some of them might be good, some of them might be really bad. That's why that, that, so the blue-grey cattle breeders, if you ask them, they'll always say the first cross is the best. You may as well go back and keep reproducing that first cross. In order to do that, you need the pure breeds. Yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, there was someone else there, yes. Uh, the gentleman in the hats. So it's a question for John, and it's not a planted question at all, John. So you've been talking about sausages, and you only talked about pork sausages. So, over the last four weeks, what's been your favourite sausage that you've tasted? So, uh, two weeks ago, I had the pleasure of eating 37 different sausages in sort of a, probably about a 10-minute spell. Um, all from uh, rare breed uh, meats, varying from lamb to, uh, to pork, all varieties of pork. Um, and they were fantastic. Um, and I think a lamb sausage has won this year. Um, and it was a fantastically slightly sweet. I can't remember the breed of the uh, the lamb. It was Bora Ray. There we go. Right. Would I you wouldn't like be able to, to pronounce it anyway. John, would you like to meet the producer? <laughs> Where is the producer? <laughs> oh, hello. That lady there. Hello. <laughs> Your sausage was lovely. <laughs> there you go. We would haven't had that said in the theatre so you. far today. So would that's like the first. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to say where Borrowe sheep came from? Yeah, just tell us a bit about... Uh... Yeah, well, we've been keeping Borrowe now for about um, 10 years. I, I actually keep Manx Locktons. I've been keeping those for 30 years, but we sort of branched out and took some Borrowe's on because they're not the easiest breed for people to take on and keep. Um, they, they do look after themselves very well. They're very hardy, but they, um, they're not very easy to catch, let's put it that way. Uh, why, um, where did they originally come from? They come from the Western Isles of the Outer Hebrides, right out. It's If you look on a map and find St Kilda, they're actually further out than that. And we have actually travelled there, um, which feel very lucky to have done that because it's quite a difficult place to get to. And and actually, we were, we were just totally awestruck by the place because they actually live on a rock sticking out of the sea and that's that's the only way I can describe it it is just the most harsh environment you could possibly imagine anything living on it's um, it's awesome I think there is a tiny bit of grass on the top of it and they survive on that um, we're lucky lucky enough to have some of my little boy here shows them as well so we wanted to make the sausages from the Borrowe because we wanted to pass the message on that as you've said before, if you don't use these breeds, you lose them. Borrowers are very difficult to finish for a commercial producer like yourself to cook in a restaurant because you need two years to finish them. And then there's still a small carcass. People aren't interested in buying them because they're a small carcass, but they taste absolutely amazing. And we just wanted to find something that we could market the Borrowers with and, and say this is from Britain's rarest breed of, 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 of sheep and it, and it tastes bloody good <laughs> basically <laughs> and the point here is as well is it's putting us back in touch with the geography of the uk isn't it you know there there are just rocks sticking out to sea with very little grass but there'll be a breed for that almost if you stick to your native <laughs> who breeds. said grass yeah. if you go to the northern orkneys you go to north ronald's day they haven't got any grass so they built a wall and they feed them on seaweed wow there we go unfortunately um, borrowers can't eat seaweed because it's just cliffs so they they can't even get to the sea <laughs> Goodness me. And what was this competition? This was a competition for the sort of best rare breed sausage, was it? It was for pedigree native breeds. And, and the, important, the, the important thing about it was it was for pedigree breeds, which, which for rare breed survival trust is, is the most important thing because if people don't register their animals and register them as pedigree, there is no way of monitoring them. And we're talking about the monitoring them. You can't do that unless people register them. So 
you know, there'll be lots of people that do have rare breeds, mm. Mm. but we have no way of knowing unless they're actually registered with the Keeping ABST. Track of the numbers, yeah. Brilliant. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for all the questions. That was absolutely lovely. Um, and thanks again to the panel here. Um, enlightening stuff. So go away. Look up a rare breed from your area. Go and ask your butcher about it. Get stuck in. And uh, please, round of applause once more for this lovely panel. <laughs> <laughs>